Today we're going to be taking a look inside the Toyota 3VZE engine to see what's inside and how it works. And the 3VZ engine is a 3 liter V6 engine mostly used in Toyota trucks. This one's out of a 95 4Runner with a blown head gasket. Now taking a quick look around this engine you can see you've got a cast iron block with an aluminum head and these valve covers which are surprisingly made of plastic. We've also got a distributor over here. This is long before a coil on plug was mainstream. Then coming around the front here we do have a timing cover as well as the drive for the mechanical fan. Coming around the side over here these engines are normally mounted longitudinally which means that the time belt sits at the front and the flywheel side sits at the back. Now over the top here we do have electronic fuel injection which was very new at the time. At the top here we've got our intake manifold which would sit up here and our exhaust manifold which would sit at the side here. Now these engines are really known to blow head gaskets. Some people really like them, some people really hate them. So let's tear this down to see just what causes these to fail. Right, we're going to start by removing the valve cover bolts here. Right, I'm going to go ahead and pop this valve cover out here. Check that out, it's pretty full of sludge and grime. Now inside of here you'll notice that things are pretty ugly and really really sludgy. Besides that, you also notice that there's half as much cams as you're used to. That's because this is a 12 valve engine with only two valves per cylinder as opposed to being a 24 valve engine. The next step I'm going to work on taking off these port fuel injectors from the intake. And then let's lift the fuel rail off. Now I wanted to unbolt the intake but it looks like coolant flows through this little bracket over here. So in order to do that, I'd probably have to get the timing cover off first. So instead, I'm going to go ahead and remove the driver's side valve cover. Yeah, this one's just as bad as the other side. Lots of sludge underneath there. You also see how it's a bit creamy inside of there. That means coolant and oil has mixed together, probably due to the head gasket leak. Next up, we're going to remove the distributor. Now, the distributor is responsible for firing the spark plugs in the correct timing, according to the timing of this camshaft, which is powered off of. That's why it's got this little slot over here where you can adjust its timing. And here you can see what the distributor looks like. This is going to turn. This thing is really stiff and almost seized up and that's going to fire each spark plug accordingly. Someone was also having a leak around here. You could tell they put RTV around this. Next up, let's remove this upper timing cover. Bunch of 10 mils. It looks like that stud is in the way. All right, so now I'm going to have to come in with my stud removal tool. And now I can pop off the timing cover. Here you can see we've got a look at the top half of the timing system of the 3VZ engine. You can see there's a bunch of crust here from the water pump which is actually leaking. I'm going to relieve some of that tension by removing these two 12 millimeter bolts that hold the timing tensioner on. And pull the tensioner out. This is just a very simple spring loaded tensioner. There's no hydraulics. Now here there's a 10 mil hex that hold the tensioner assembly on. Now the tensioner is not going to come out but I know the belt is now loose. Right, let's see if we can knock these cams loose. All right, so I got a wrench holding the cam there. Let's see if we can bust this bolt free. No. All right, I got a big pipe on there. Yep, that did it there. Yes. Okay, can't get the crank bolt loose. Let's see if I can get the crank off with my impact. All right, let's remove these bolts here that hold the crank pulley on. So that just removes this outer pulley here. All right, back up at the top here. I'm going to remove these cam bolts. And then I can take off the timing belt, remove the cam. This was way before variable valve timing existed. All right, I'm going to go ahead and remove all the tens that hold the rear timing cover on. All right, that comes off there. And now I've got clearer access to the intake area here where I can remove this idler pulley. This idler pulley is really done for it. So the idler pulley is actually part of this water jacket where coolant flows inside of the engine in the middle here. Now I'm going to go ahead and remove all the 12 millimeter bolts that hold this intake to the heads. Now if you're doing this on a real truck, you're probably going to want to vacuum out all the stuff that's inside of there. Now looking down in between here, you can see this is the knock sensor and that also is a kind of a common problem on these. If you had to replace the wiring or the sensor itself, you can see it's a lot of work to kind of get down here. Especially that you have to play with the timing system. Looks like the rubber is completely gone from that one. Looks like we've got a coolant crossover pipe that comes on the water pump side out to the top of the engine here. So we're going to go ahead and remove the two 12s. Now the good thing with these crossover pipes is that they're made of metal so they can burst and leak like the newer 1MZ 3 liter V6s that Toyota put out. Next up I'm going to work on removing the camshafts. Now you probably don't need to remove the camshaft on this engine because if it's old school design you can actually access the head bolts on the outside and the inside here pretty easily. I'm going to go ahead and remove all the 10 millimeter bolts around here. 
Taking a look at these cam bearings, they are pretty scored up. Maybe the engine was starved of oil or the coolant didn't do a good job of lubricating these. So I'm interested to see what the bottom end looks like if it's even more scored up. There's the distributor housing and it's got a cam bearing at the bottom there too. One more bearing at the back here and it's got a cap which always leaks. And here I can remove the camshaft. This is really, really dirty. And you can see here, this is the gear that's going to power the distributor and the front cam seal over here. Let's remove the cam bolts on the passenger side. Take a look at those bearings and you can see they are also scored up just like the other side. Whoa, my toe! I'm just going to clean things up a little bit on this engine here before we work on the head. I'm going to remove this AC compressor. Whoa, that's heavy. And we'll just get this bracket off the front here. One more bracket here. Now inside of this housing here we have the thermostat. Surprisingly it's made of plastic, which is a move that you haven't really seen back in the 80s. And here you can see the plastic thermostat housing and the thermostat itself. Check out all that slop and goop that I found inside of that thermostat housing. Alright, now I'm going to remove the head bolts. These are a 12.12 millimeter socket. Right now we should be able to remove this head. You can just see where this head gasket's starting to fail here. Also, what the heck is this stuff? Some kind of sealant? Alright, let's knock the head bolts loose on the driver's side. Now let's see if we can get this head off. Whoa! Alright, well it's pretty clear to see that we've got a lot of crap built up in this engine. It's just a mix of coolant and oil that's built up here, likely due to the gasket failure. So let me see if we can remove this gasket and we can have a closer look. Now the main issue with the 3VZ engine is the head gasket. Now when engines made before 1990, things were all good. They didn't have problems with head gaskets, but the head gaskets were made of asbestos and that's not a good product because it's cancer causing. Now the newer gaskets don't have asbestos, but they really suck. Look at this. You can see a piece of it's actually falling apart here and you can see all the glob and stuff from the coolant and oil that's mixed together and leaked over. You can see they've used a semi-open deck design here where you've got the coolant jackets on the outside and of course the combustion chamber on the inside. Now when coolant starts to seep into the combustion chamber that's when you end up with this coolant oil mess that you see here and over here and that's the result of, of course the head gasket being really bad and you can see here these coolant jackets being really close to the combustion chamber furthermore you can see the coolant jackets are completely clogged there's supposed to be a hole over here see on this side here again it's completely clogged with this coolant mix and Toyota actually extended the warranty on these back when these were pretty new now, apparently the most updated design has fixed this issue now, of course when your head gasket blows you basically have no coolant in the system and it's going to cause your vehicle to overheat and that can cause the heads or even the block itself to warp now those heads are made of aluminum which are pretty soft so when they do warp that means you have to take it to a machine shop when you redo the head gasket now apparently the new version of these head gaskets do solve the issue so once you do get this vehicle up and running and take a few precautions to make sure it doesn't overheat it should be pretty reliable now here's the passenger side head gasket now you can see i do notice the same out of round design you can see there is a lot of that coolant stuff built up on the head gasket itself that's not supposed to happen. The coolant is supposed to remain clean throughout the system. You can see this side of the engine block did a lot better. There's not too much coolant mixed in with the oil over here. Let's get the oil filter off. Check out all that oil sludge inside of there. Now that I've stripped it, I'm gonna flip it. Oh boy. So you see that green coolant? That's actually part of the problem. Some of the crust that I found in the water pump is actually pink and Toyota coolant is supposed to be pink. So someone's definitely not put the right coolant in here and mixed green coolant with pink coolant. Alright, so we got an oil leak here. I ran inside and I got my brother's t-shirt. Hopefully that should take care of the mess. I got my wife's brand new Canada shirt. I that will take care of it. This engine uses a steel oil pan as you can see and it's got a really weird shape to it probably because the differential sits somewhere around here. I'm going to go ahead and remove all the 10 millimeter volts all the way around so we can have a look. I think these bolts are actually a little bit short. Let's open this up. Now taking a look inside of that oil pan it's an absolute mess. You can see just how sludged up it is. Just a milky disaster. Taking a look around here you can see you've got the bottom oil baffle. We have the pickup tube here. Kind of looks clogged with that sticky oily stuff. Now we've got the oil pump at the front here to which it feeds into. Let's zip that off. You can pry this guy off. So here's the oil baffle. Turning this engine over it doesn't seem very very smooth at all. They're actually pretty easy to get off. I guess the cold is just really taking a toll on my battery.
I try to pop these pistons out the bottom. All right, so I've got something wedged in here. Let's see if we can get this crank bolt off. Harmonic balancer. So now with all the pistons out of there, I'm gonna go ahead and crack these main cap bolts loose. And now I can lift off this bottom bearing cradle. Now these bottom bearings here do have a little bit of scoring on them. So I guess when it ran low on cooling, it also ran a little low on the oil. So here's the difference between some of the newer engines like the 1MZ that replaced this. This here is a cast iron block and they've used a nice sturdy ladder frame design here instead of individual bearing races that are cross bolted. This one here is not cross bolted, but it's a pretty strong ladder frame design. The reason why it's not cross bolted is because your block here is already pretty sturdy being made of cast iron, whereas the newer 1MZ series are made of aluminum and they kind of have to cross bolt them to keep things together when you put a lot of power down. Here I can remove the rear main seal. All right, next up I'm going to take off this little timing cover here for the... There's a bunch of 12 mil bolts that go around the oil pump housing. Next let's take care of this big water pump housing here. Ooh, look at how many bolt head holes here you can see just looking from the front of the engine. I think it just needs a good couple of wax. And there's that water pump cover slash fan pulley housing. And then I can remove this and the timing belt off of there. And the belt itself has definitely changed over its life. It's not in really bad shape with any cracks or anything. Check out how much crust is on here from the water pump leaking. You can see this stuff is pink. Now in a normal world, this gear would just slide right off and this keyway would come with it. In another normal world, you'd also have two little threaded holes here that you could use a puller to pull this gear off. But it seems like this gear is pretty much rusted on there and that's going to be blocking the oil pump. So we're going to have to take off the crankshaft and oil pump together maybe. All right, so here's the oil pump. Usually that would be able to walk right off with that gear on there. Now I'm going to lift off the crankshaft. There we go. The water pump assembly. Here is the water pump assembly and its gasket. Oh, it's so crusty. They put RTV on it. You're not supposed to put RTV on these metal gaskets. Now that water pump has a line that runs over here to the oil cooler. Surprisingly, it's not integrated into the oil filter assembly. Got a 24 millimeter bolt. It's messy. Let's see if I can get this engine off of the stand. Yeah. I just gotta get the stand off the engine. Alright, so now we've got the entire engine taken apart. Let's take a closer look at some of these components. Now let's start with the block itself. You can see it says 3VZ up here. This is the front of the block where the water pump would sit. And that oil pump, along with the crankshaft, was sitting over here at the front. And that's the oil inlet. Taking a quick look at the lubrication system. Oil is going to enter over here, get filtered out by the oil filter. Then be sent through these valleys over here to get cooled off by the oil cooler. The oil is then going to be sent back over here down to the middle. Inside of here, there's that oil galley that sends it down to the middle. There is an oil galley that runs along the middle inside of this V here. And you can see that the main bearings are tapped down to get oil from that to lubricate the crankshaft and connecting rod. Finally looking up at the top here with that main galley running down the middle, you can see that we have a tap up here and one over here for the oil feed on both heads over here to lubricate the head with oil. When it comes to the cooling system, well we already talked about the notorious head gasket issue on these. Besides that, you can see that semi-closed deck design here where the cavity doesn't go all the way around. There's these pieces in between to help strengthen it up. That's pretty good for an iron block design which is already pretty strong. Here you can see the, where the water pumps sit. Now taking a look at the pistons themselves, they are pretty medium and hefty compared to a lot of modern engines I've taken apart. One thing I noticed is that the wrist pins are kind of sticky and that's probably because of lack of lubrication in the wrist pin. It's kind of like that for all the pistons here. And this one over here. Wow, that's pretty stuck, yeah. There is a bit of carbon buildup on the top, but that's probably just due to age and mileage. I don't have the mileage information on this vehicle. One thing I noticed with a lot of older engines I take apart is that these oil control rings are huge. And that's why they used to use like 10W and 15W weight oil, because the clearances in these engines are a lot larger than a lot of modern engines. Looking at these oil control rings, I can see that they are pretty free to move. They're not really clogged up with carbon like a lot of newer engines do so maybe this engine wasn't burning that much oil but looking at this one it probably was burning coolant not only does it cause it to not lubricate itself but some parts that are not supposed to have coolant start to rust away that's why you end up with this glob of rusty stuff now taking a look at this head here you can see there's a lot of crusties and some of the pistons that suffered the head gasket failure now there is no bent valves in here this is a non-interference engine so if that timing belt does snap the piston doesn't really risk colliding with the valve because the valve doesn't open enough to touch it and you can just put a new timing belt kit on this and it'll just keep running. Of course one of the downsides to this engine is that it only has two valves per cylinder and that's why it's got a nickname of being the three point slow. It really doesn't produce much power. It's only got about 150 horsepower, 180 pound feet of torque which is not much if you've got big wheels on your 4Runner or your Tacoma. Furthermore because you only have two valves you're really limited in terms of the 
amount of air you can push through this engine. So even if you were thinking of supercharging, turbocharging, or even just putting a proper intake and exhaust on this thing, you're really restricted by just the airflow of these two valves. Taking a look at the top here, just got a cam bucket design. There's no lifter, rocker arms, or hydraulically adjustable arms. You have to adjust this the old school way by replacing these parts here and shimming them up every so often to get your valve clearances in check. One of the bigger flaws with this engine is the way the exhaust runs it doesn't really help the head gasket issue. You get your exhaust running on this side and the exhaust running off this side and then the exhaust kind of curves right around the back here before going out one side. Now because of all the heat kind of situated at the back of the engine here, it doesn't really help because you're now adding heat to the situation on an already weakened head gasket. What a lot of aftermarket people do is they install nice headers on here, put some header wrap on here and route the exhaust away from the back of the head here and route it down to the back as a dual exhaust setup or something different just so that you don't have that crossover pipe here lending to more heat. Now one more thing, if you're doing a head gasket job on one of these, make sure you replace these torque to yield bolts because they do stretch and you can't really reuse them. You're going to have to get some head studs and Instead. Here's what the crankshaft looks like. I couldn't get that oil pump off, but it would just sit right here directly powered by the crankshaft. You can see we have four main bearings over here, and that's because in between you got these two pistons which are about 60 degrees apart or so, and they're going to run in a V shape. So side to side you might be balanced, but along the here you only have three sets of pistons, and that's going to cause the motor to kind of rock this way. Overall it's going to be smoother than a four cylinder but people actually prefer the four cylinder in these because they're just easier to work on in the truck. Check out this engine mount, just a piece of rubber that sits on this bracket here. This was long before the days of active engine mounts. I've actually never taken apart a distributor before. All right, so here's how this works. Looks like the camshaft spins this guy over here. We got power coming into here to the ignition coil and that has to distribute it to the six cylinders when it rotates. Got the contact points inside of here to which this piece here is going to rotate and distribute it to exactly the six cylinders over here on the correct timing. Look at the cluggage inside of this. Now the head gasket issue on the 3VZ engine actually gave it a lot of bad reputation. The bottom end is actually pretty solid so once the head gasket issue is actually fixed you got a pretty reliable engine although it is pretty slow. As a matter of fact a lot of people like to swap into 3.4 liter engine from the newer Toyota 4Runner because that tends to turn those big 13 inch wheels a little bit better. I just think Toyota kind of dropped the ball in this one and sourced the head gaskets out of like a Subaru factory or something. Now make sure you subscribe if you want to see more videos just like this one.